Uh. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Emiliano, and I am one of the co-programming directors for um, Medical Marvels. And my name is Sid, and I'm the other co-programming director for Medical Marvels. So Medical Marvels is a nonprofit global organization that promotes medical literacy and awareness for pre-health students. Since 2020, 1,100 plus members have joined the Medical Marvels community, which spans across 30 plus countries, and the numbers only continue to grow. So with relation to just kind of what me and Emiliano have been doing for the past couple of months, um, we've basically been helping set up and facilitate a bunch of events for the Medical Marvels community um, and for you guys to enjoy online. Um, so of this these events that we've been make, um, setting up, most of them have been kind of like online panels like this one, uh, with this specific event being the fourth one of our fifth that we have planned for this year. Um, prior, you may have attended our event with the American Red Cross or the psychiatrist, Dr. Sunder, or our cardiothoracic surgeon, Dr. Noble. Today, we will be joined by Dr. Brubaker, Brubaker who will be um, telling us more about gender affirming care. Um, without further ado, would our special guests like to introduce themselves? Hello, nice to be here. Thank you so much for having me. I'm Dr. Libby Brubaker. My pronouns are she, her. And I figured I'd kind of start off in telling you a little bit about my journey and how I got to where I am and about my work in gender affirming hormone therapy and also give you all a chance to ask questions. Sound good? All right. So, um, I just wanted to say off the bat, I am a cisgendered woman and my experience is my experience as someone in a cisgendered body and that uh, my experience with this work may be different from other people's experiences with this work. Um, and I do want to acknowledge all of the amazing trans and non-binary individuals who do work in gender affirming hormone therapy. Um, for their contributions to the body of literature and the care that we all provide. And also acknowledge that there may be additional emotional labor that those individuals may experience as trans and non-binary individuals and physicians also delivering trans and non-binary care. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Um, a little bit about me. So I grew up in rural Illinois. I did my undergraduate degree at University of Illinois Chicago, and I studied French and biology. I then went into a master's in public health program at Boston University, where my focus was on maternal and child health. Um, from there, I went to LA for medical school. I studied at Western University of Health Sciences, and um, I was really debating what I wanted to do um, between, and I was deciding between OBGYN and family medicine. And so um, my, my interest had always been in the sexual and reproductive health realm. Um, and I ended up going into family medicine and I matched at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. And the Institute for Family Health, which is a full spectrum family medicine residency program here in New York City. Um, I am still in New York City after five and a half years. I love it here. <laughs> and um, I chose my residency program specifically because um, they do full spectrum family planning as part of the family medicine residency program which is really cool. Um, we're one of the few family medicine clinics that do gender affirming care, HIV medicine, as well as outpatient procedural and medication abortion work as part of residency training. Um, so I was fortunate enough to get a lot of training in sexual and reproductive health and not need to do a fellowship program in this field. Um, I did rotations at Planned Parenthood to get training in the work that I'm so passionate about. And I 
um, started working at Planned Parenthood right after residency. Um, at Planned Parenthood, um, I did full spectrum family planning clinic as well as procedural abortions and also gender affirming hormone therapy. And I became the director of the gender affirming care program. Um, I, after over two years in that position recently left, I'm now the medical director for a clinic in Harlem near where I trained in residency. And I also do procedural abortions at another clinic um, to keep my skill set up. Um, so I still see every age of human being that walks into the clinic um, with an emphasis on sexual and reproductive health. Um, and my two passions, hormone therapy and um, abortions are still very much part of the work that I do day to day. So that's kind of a little bit about me and my path to getting here. I'll tell you a little bit more about the work that I do. And then at the end, I'm happy to answer questions that you may have either about my journey or the work. Um, so a little bit more about uh, gender affirming hormone care. So I wanted to first kind of explain what that means. Um, so gender identity is how we feel about the gender, um, about our gender on the inside. And then we may express the gender that we feel in the inside outwardly in different ways, or maybe not. And how we feel about our gender um, is different from sexual orientation. Sexual orientation would be related to who we are attracted to, um, or if we're attracted to anyone or have interest in sexual activity with other human beings or not. So those two things are separate. Um, you cannot know someone's gender identity or sexual orientation without having a conversation with them. So it's not something that we can assume about other people. It's something that we have a sense of on the inside and then can choose to communicate with other people. Um, people who, so in this country and in many countries, when someone's born, they're assigned a sex at birth based on the genitalia of the baby that's born. And so we call that sex assigned at birth. For some people, the sex that and the sex that people tend to be assigned are either male or female, or in some cases, intersex, which is a is a whole collection of other medical, hormonal, physiological, physical, and other characteristics that require a medical diagnosis. Um, but typically, male or female is assigned to a baby based on the genitalia. Um, for some folks, the gender that they identify with matches the sex they were assigned at, at birth. So using myself as an example, signed, assigned female at birth was my sex and my gender identity aligns with what I was assigned. So therefore, I'm a cisgender person. There are people who the sex they were assigned at birth does not fit their sense of gender identity. And those folks may identify as part of the trans community. Um, and the trans community uh, is kind of an umbrella and can include people who don't identify as either male or female, um, that don't ascribe to gender as a binary and may de describe themselves as something other than male or female. It also includes individuals who identify as gender queer or gender fluid. And for some people, that means that their sense of gender identity um, maybe can fluctuate from time to time, um, or their sense of expression may vary in certain situations, or maybe um, they feel agender and need, no gender really suits them. And so there's a lot of terminology that these people choose for themselves to kind of describe their understanding of their own gender. And again, this is something that no one can assume by looking at folks from the outside. This is something that someone would have to tell us. So it's best not to assume. <laughs> um, and then, so 
There are many ways that in the medical field that we can affirm someone's gender. Um, and that gives us gender affirming care. So the medical things that we do to help affirm someone's gender would fall under gender affirming care and would include, include things like gender affirming hormone therapy or gender affirming surgery. But there are so many ways that we affirm gender, not in a medical setting, but ways that we affirm gender just in general. So for example, has anyone ever gotten a haircut? Has anyone ever changed their outfit or gone shopping in general? Has anyone ever put on makeup? Has anyone ever put on deodorant or perfume? Has anyone changed the hair on their body in any way, whether that's shaving, waxing, electrolysis, has anyone ever tried to make their hair grow more by taking supplements or using certain shampoos, um, putting accessories on our bodies, piercing, all of these things affirm our genders. So we practice gender affirming things in our own lives every single day, regardless of what gender we identify with. There's so many ways that we every single day affirm our genders. And in addition to that, there are other medical interventions that are also for anyone of any gender, whether someone identifies as cisgender, transgender, non-binary. Um, for example, there are medications that we can take to help with things like acne um, or irregular periods. And sometimes those things affect the hormones in our bodies. And the effect of the hormones in the body is also can produce very affirming and even gender affirming effects. Um, sometimes you'll hear about um, older folks taking Viagra or taking testosterone supplements to help with things like sex drive, um, there's lots of folks who go and exercise at the gym to try to change the shape of their body, to develop more muscle mass or taking a protein shake. All these things can affirm someone's gender identity and do result in physical changes to the body. Um, and then even things like changing um, how much sweat we produce, whether it's through using deodorant or medicated deodorant or um, there's even Botox that people can get to change the amount of sweat production on the body. Um, there's all sorts of things related to hair growth. Um, and then of course, people of any gender can get surgery to change their appearance, whether it's you know getting a Brazilian butt lift or a nose job or a boob job or Botox and fillers, getting facials, et cetera. Um, all of these are things that people of all genders use to kind of affirm their gender identity. So practicing gender affirming, so being in the practice of affirming our genders is something that we all do. Um, so this relates specifically, it's specifically important um, in gender affirming care and the work that I do um, seeing uh, trans and non-binary patients because the interventions that I mentioned above that they may take to affirm their gender identities may involve or require medical intervention. Not always, but some folks choose to start on hormone therapy or pursue surgical procedures to affirm their gender in addition to all of the things that I mentioned above that we all do to affirm our genders on a daily basis. Um, so just to kind of walk you through what an intake appointment would look like. Um, so in general, I see patients age 16 and up. Um, I have patients from like 16 years old all the way up to like 80. I have patients on their 80s who are on hormone therapy with me. Um, but the appointment uh, starts with an intake. Um, the intake appointment 
gets a medical history from the patient, understands you know what medications they're taking, what medical problems they've been diagnosed with, if they've ever had any surgical procedures in the past. All of these are important when considering what medications and how to take them. Um, the hormone therapy may help affirm their gender identity. I also get a sense of what their goals are. So people can have different goals from what they want to happen. Um, some people want to look like a different gender as much as possible. So some patients will come to me and they say, I want maximum feminization. I want the long, shiny hair. I want the boobs. I want the curly, uh, the curvy body. Um, I want my skin to be softer. I want less hair on the rest of my body. Um, they may say I'm less worried about, you know, sex drive or sex performance, things like that. Um, and then I may have a patient who comes in who wants mas maximum masculinization, which may look like potentially less hair on the top of the head, thicker, rougher skin, more facial hair, less hair, um, also more hair on the rest of the body. They may be looking for increased muscle mass and muscle strength. They may be looking for bottom growth or genitalia growth. Um, they may be looking for more lib libido or sex drive or more energy. Um, and then I also get patients who come in and say, you know, I've always felt emotionally more feminine and I maybe don't have a strong preference for my body to look maximum feminization, but maybe um, they're looking for a low level of feminizing hormone that may help them feel more kind of feminine or in touch with their mood and emotions on the inside. And maybe they're looking for less physical changes, but looking for more mood and emotional changes. And all of those situations are okay. And we can always adjust and kind of dose um, medications accordingly to do our best to help patients achieve a physical appearance or an emotional experience that best matches their sense of their gender identity. Um, there, so the options for hormones, so for folks who want to present more female or feminization, want more feminization, we use the main feminizing hormone, which is estrogen. Estrogen can be taken in a lot of different ways. Um, some folks also take progesterone, which is another like supplement to estrogen in terms of getting feminine features. Um, it can be taken as a pill. It can be used as a patch, that like a sticker on the body. It can be um, injected either into the fat tissue or into the muscle tissue. There's a gel, which is newer. Um, and then for folks who want more masculinizing features, um, the main hormone for masculinization would be testosterone. Um, and testosterone can be taken also a number of different ways. There's a gel, there's a patch, which was recently discontinued, which we're all sad about. Um, there's injections, there's pills. And there's a longer acting injection that's newer that can last a few months. And then there's also um, uh, pellets, the like dissolvable pellets that can get injected into the fat tissue of the buttocks and they dissolve over time. And that lasts many months. So there's lots of different options. There are also medications like spironolactone, which is often used for um, helping with acne and decreasing acne for folks. Um, that one can be a bit of a testosterone blocker. And so there are additional options for blocking certain hormones. And we kind of choose a regimen that works the best um, to help the patient achieve their goals. Um, I tell all my patients that these changes happen slowly over time. 
everyone's body is different. The genetics that they were born into may play a big role in what physical changes they're going to get. Um, I let them know that just like our body is going through puberty and um, it may take several years, two, three, four, five, six, seven years to get full effects of exposure to the cross hormone or the other hormone that um, they're looking for. And so time is also a key component component here. Um, and I also tell them that it's okay for them to change their minds or for their goals to change over time, that it's okay to start, stop, increase, or decrease doses at any time as long as their levels are safe. And so there's a lot of flexibility in helping people kind of achieve what they're looking for and touching base with me regularly and checking some blood tests regularly um, allow us to help make sure that we're always moving towards a goal that feels right for the patient. There are a few aspects of um, both estrogen therapy and testosterone therapy that some changes might not be fully reversible. So I do let patients know that but I also let them know that this is a very gradual process. So if at any point where changes are starting to develop that aren't feeling right for the patient, we can always check back in and decrease the doses or stop or switch methods, and that's okay. Um, the exploration of our genders really is a journey throughout our lives. Um, People of all genders, including cisgendered individuals, may change our hair, our clothing style, um, you know, what we're doing to, you know, what we're doing to our bodies may change over time as we change locations, as we move, as we change friend groups, as our understanding of ourselves and who we are changes over time. So just like our understanding of ourselves and our identities evolves um, over time, you know, so does that for anyone else. And that, you know, that's part of the journey of life. And that's one of the cool things about discovering who we are. Um, I do want to acknowledge that there are a lot of there's been a lot of media attention lately about gender affirming hormone therapy and gender affirming care. There are states, uh, speaking to the United States specifically, there have been hundreds and hundreds of bills that have tried to restrict access to gender affirming care, gender affirming hormone therapy, et cetera. Um, and the bills that have been proposed and the laws that have been proposed to restrict access to this care are incredibly dangerous to our patients um, and also dangerous to the medical profession that seeks only to affirm individuals in their experience with their gender identity. Um, there are myths out there that that children are undergoing surgeries, and that is just not the case. Um, all surgeries that are happening to affirm gender identity are occurring in adults, and they're occurring in adults who have been on the path of pursuing their identity through some for through hormones, but not always, but they've been in conversation with their doctors and therapists, and they've been seeking ways to affirm the identity that fits with them for many months to many years before undergoing a surgical procedure. So the myths out there that seven-year-olds are getting surgery, that's just absolutely not true. Um, some early adolescents are able to access puberty blockers, which I'm not going to talk about too extensively, 
Um, but basically it, there's a way just like with precocious puberty or kids that hit puberty a little bit too early, faster than their bones are able to catch up to, are able to temporarily delay puberty for a couple of years to allow that individual's sense of their own gender identity to, um, to kind of come become more clear, come to fruition. And the individuals who are delaying puberty are having those conversations with a specialist in pediatric psychiatry who specializes in gender identity and gender affirming therapy, along with their patients, their doctors, their pediatricians, et cetera. Um, so that like temporary delaying of puberty to um, further understand the sense of gender identity is something that is happening for some people, but to be honest, even access to that care is really, really difficult, just given our current landscape and the current number of providers who are able to offer that care by state. Most gender affirming hormone therapy is happening in 16 and 17 year olds with parental consent meaning parents are present and signing off that they're okaying starting on hormones. And we're talking low dose hormones um, to affirm their child's identity or 18 year olds all the way up through, you know, a hundred, any age really. So that's the vast majority of um, the patients that are getting hormone therapy of the ones that are even able to access it. Um, just a couple of stories that I wanted to share with you um, from patients that I've seen. Um, one patient, and this is more to illustrate, uh, if there's two takeaways from what I have to say today, I want the two things for you to remember are that gender affirming hormone therapy is A, safe, and B, life-saving. So it's so safe that we can start we can start on very low doses and we can very, very slowly adjust the doses of medication over time. Nothing happens overnight. There's lots of opportunity all throughout the process for people to give feedback about how they're feeling, about how things are going and ensure that there's never um, or rarely a point at which changes occur that they wish hadn't happened. Um, the media makes it seem like tons of people are going out and getting surgeries and regretting it. And that's really just not the statistics. Statistically, of people who end up getting gender affirming surgery, the regret rate is 0.3%. And this has been validated by a number of studies. You know what the regret rate is for knee replacements? six to 30 percent and for spine surgery it's one in five individuals regrets getting spine surgery so overall the rates of regret are incredibly low um, for this work and incredibly inflated by the media so don't get tricked on that um but let me just tell you about uh, one of my patients um i've changed the name for privacy but i had a patient rico um, identifies as a trans male, 16 year old, um, presented with his mom was coming into my clinic just after turning, I believe he was just, he'd just turned 16 and heard like, okay, if I get my parents permission, I'm 16. Now I can start on hormones. They're overall very anxious, but also very, very excited to start on T, um, or testosterone. He'd done his research. He was really excited to start. Um, he, um, definitely was a little bit nervous about the process, but feeling overall pretty excited. He, we used a start low, go slow approach. So, um, we started on a testosterone gel, um, a gel that basically comes in a pump bottle, like most gels that, you know, you get at the store. Um, and he applied, just a couple of pumps of gel to the surface of the skin behind his shoulder blade, um, let it dry completely. And he would do this once a night so that, you know, it's in a location where it's not going to rub off onto other people. 
easy for him to do it himself. Um, over the few months, um, he was recording his, the changes to his vocal cords. He was feeling stronger. He noticed that um, his like uh, energy levels were better, and he overall was starting to feel um, more and more confident in himself over time. And he, you know, visit after visit was just so excited every single time to tell me all of the changes that he was noticing with his body that were feeling really affirming. Um, and yeah, just a really cool story. The mom was initially kind of hesitant, reserved about the whole process, but as um, she noticed her kid, Rico, get more and more and more like happy um, with the changes that he was experiencing, she felt a lot more relieved that like this was the right choice for, for her kid. So very safe. Um, as I mentioned, I've also taken care of people of all ages. I've had um, patients who are 78 years old who have never been on hormones, never identified openly as trans or non-binary to anyone in their whole lives have come to me and said, Hey, listen, like I just retired. I known my entire life that I don't identify as the gender that I've been presenting at. And I want to start hormones. Like this is my chance. This is my chance to finally live the life that I have always wanted for myself. Um, and the cool thing about hormone therapy is that all of us have estrogen and testosterone in our bodies at all times. So when we talk about starting someone on hormones, we're just giving them a little more of hormones that their body is already producing. We're just giving them a little bit more to put them into the range of the gender that they're seeking changes to. Um, occur. Um, so safety, very, very, very safe. Um, and then in terms of life-saving, so I had another patient, um, Julia, she came into clinic. She was in her thirties, early thirties. She, uh, identified as a trans woman, trans woman interested in starting on estrogen. She was so timid. She barely made eye contact with me dressed in all black, um, black and chains and just kind of stared at the ground, would barely make eye contact, mm -hmm. incredibly withdrawn. She had been having a hard time holding down jobs. Her ADHD was really bad. She was just couldn't focus on anything, just was very, um, very low self-esteem and had been in and out of the hospital for suicide attempts, um, incredibly depressed. Um, she came in and it was a little bit hard to even get goals from her because she had difficulty like fully articulating what she was seeking. But she did say like, I, I want to be a woman. I want to be, I want to look like a woman. You know, I know that's who I am. I want all the changes that, you know, I can get, but um, even making eye contact or getting her to engage in the conversation was a bit difficult at first. Um, the changes with Julia she, um, she wanted to start on injections. She'd never done injections before. So she came in and we did several appointments where we together, I taught her how to give herself an injection, similar to how folks who are diabetic learn how to give themselves injections for diabetes. Um, and so we did a lot of practice appointments together until she felt comfortable. And then she started doing injections on her own. And she, over time, she started making eye contact. She was more communicative. She said she felt so much calmer that the noise in her head that was constantly distracting her with the ADHD, she said that that actually improved a lot as she started on hormones. She was less depressed, less suicidal. Um, she started wearing more colors. She started wearing more dresses. She, um, you know, made eye contact and was just, just really blossomed. Um, she just had so many really positive changes. Um, we had several emotional moments together. 
where she would, um, you know, cry and just uh, shed a few tears and say, you know, this actually saved my life. Like I would not be alive right now if I hadn't been able to start on hormones. I feel so much better about myself. I feel more confident walking around in the world. Um, I'm so happy. I never thought I would be in this place. And if I wasn't, if I didn't have the opportunity to start on hormones when I did, I wouldn't be alive. Um, really amazing stories, like just a beautiful person. Um, and these two patients are just two examples of that I wanted to share about how safe and how life affirming and life saving uh, hormone therapy can be. So I have these moments a lot with my patients. It makes the work feel so rewarding to be able to, um, to provide very, very safe and effective treatments and really be able to affirm someone living the life that they've always wanted for themselves and to have the care affirm their identities. Um, so yeah, I carry many of these stories very close to home and it, it's really what keeps me going and doing this work. All right. So I will stop there. I am happy to answer questions about my work, about the medicine, um, about you know, really anything. Um, but I just want to save time for questions. So feel free to jump in. Okay, I see a question here in the chat. Okay, is there a specific reason you took French in college? I'm thinking about doing it, but I'm curious to hear how you balance it with other things like preparing for the MCAT. Um, so I studied French in high school, and so I wanted to continue studying French in college. Um, I minored in French and I majored in biology. So I was still able to hit all the classes that I needed as a pre-med to be able to ultimately apply to medical school. Um, I, you know, I used French as elective, as, you know, an elective. I considered majoring it, but um, I also wanted to kind of, I actually, I graduated a semester early from undergrad and ended up taking some classes in grad school before actually moving for grad school. And I was debating between like doing a major and doing a minor. Honestly, I think that you should take whatever classes are interesting. I think it's too much to only take pre-med classes because there's so many and a lot of them are really challenging. For me, I liked taking French classes because it allowed me to use a different part of my brain and take courses with different students than I had always been exposed to. To be honest, I don't think what you choose to major in is as important as choosing something that you actually legitimately care about studying. Like it's your chance to, to learn about whatever you want and no matter where you're at in school, just pick something you're passionate about. Um, in terms of studying for the MCAT, I know your MCAT's a little bit different than the one I took now, but you'll make time for it. It's, you know, it's going to be kind of built into your, um, it's going to be kind of built into your, I guess, order of classes or when you take it or whether you study over the summer or over a break, et cetera. Um, I don't think that you should choose a major based on prepping for the MCAT. Like the prep for that will, it'll fit in. Um, okay. I see another question here. Can you talk more about your journey to becoming a, a physician and why you chose family medicine? 
advice for prospective medical students in regards to matching into residency? Yeah, so I think that I chose family medicine in part because of my background in public health. Um, I really cared about, and I do still care about population health and interventions that um, help the health of more people than what physicians do. So public health professionals, they develop interventions, community interventions, policy interventions, institutional interventions that can affect the health of more people. And the work that physicians do is just one person at a time. So I like being able to have a brain that is thinking about processes that could improve to help more people than just the person in front of me. So that really fit in well with family medicine because uh, family medicine physicians, there's so many different specialties that we're able to help connect patients to. We work closely with social workers and health educators. Um, there's care coordinators, nurses, there's um, mental health professionals, I mean, we have whole teams of people that we're working with that help our patients access other aspects of their lives and resources that have just as much, if not more impact on their care than what I do one-on-one -on -one in a visit. Um, so if uh, my patient comes to me and they're so depressed that they can't take their medicine and they can't physically make it to an appointment... Um, I'm reaching out to my social worker. I'm reaching out to transportation. Can we get them a medical cab to get them to your appointments? Should we switch them to video visits? Can I have my depression team check in on this patient once a week to see how they're doing? Let's plug them in with the mental health provider. Um, we're really kind of working as a team and very collaboratively with a lot of community-based practitioners um, that are health and non-health to get patients what they need. And so that mentality fits very well with family medicine. And then, yeah, I also chose my family medicine residency program because I knew I could get great sexual and reproductive health training. Every residency program is different. So um, finding a program that's a good fit for you and what you actually are interested in is the, I think that's the most important thing is just looking at what kinds of, you know, what kinds of community partnerships do they have? Do they have faculty that specialize in certain things that you're dying to learn? Um, for me, uh, there are fellowship programs in family planning, but I, the residency program I went to was able to um, get me the training that I needed without doing a fellowship. And me personally, it's like, I've been in school for like 13 years, like I'm ready to be done with school and just work. So for me, I was looking for training that would, that I wouldn't have to do a fellowship for, but I know there's a lot of people that seek out amazing fellowship programs as well to um, go into whether it's, you know, sports medicine or, um, or family planning, or, I mean, there's so many OB fellowships, et cetera. So yeah, my advice is, yeah, just seek out the aspects of the residency that are actually important to what you want to do. Like that's, that's the only thing that's important. There's no like one program's better than another that like, that's not, I think that's made up like that's garbage. It's like, there's the programs that are best for you and there's the programs that are best for other people. And the only thing that should really matter is you looking introspectively and figuring out what you, what training, what kind of training you want to get and, um, you know, making sure they have resources there. Okay. Um, all right. Got it. Insights into the daily challenges and rewards of working in this particular field of medicine. Yeah. So I'm um, for people interested in family medicine. So there's a lot of different ways you can practice family medicine. Um, of the people in my graduating class, there's just to give you an example, there were seven in my program at my clinic in Harlem. 
I'm so close with all of them. We're best friends. We text all day, every day. Um, of the seven of us, one did a geriatrics and palliative care fellowship, and she now works at the VA um, in, um, I believe it's UCLA Long Beach um, out in California. Um, one of us, he was really interested in plant medicine and psychedelics. And so he's the medical director for a ketamine assisted psychotherapy clinic. And he also works in um, a harm reduction program as the clinic person um, for a free needle exchange program. Um, and it's a safe space that's totally free for patients who are currently experiencing um, difficulties with like mental uh, mental health and substance use. It's a safe space for them to um, get treatment and it's a uh, um, and do uh, like need free needle exchange, et cetera. Um, one is an associate medical director at the clinic where we did residency. Another one is at the VA doing um, just general outpatient family medicine. Um, for me, I worked at Planned Parenthood for a couple of years, and now I'm a little bit more back into the primary care field. I mean, there's just so many things you can do with family medicine that there's no like one size fits all. Um, there's, I have colleagues who work solely on the inpatient service and they work like one week on one week off and just do inpatient medicine and on a family medicine service. Um, I would say one of the rewards is that there's so much flexibility based on what you're interested in and you can really create and find um, a, a like clinic or inpatient or outpatient balance that fits your needs. The daily challenge with family medicine is that um, our system is completely broken. Uh, the way the healthcare system works in this country is that it doesn't and it fails a lot of people. It's too complicated to navigate. And a lot of the a lot of the like day-to-day -day, like burdens, struggles, like getting medications approved with insurance, getting patients to appointments, getting forms filled out. A lot of it does fall on primary care. We need way more than primary care people than we have. Um, so the need is always there and there's always um, work to do that requires really being like flexible and creative and partnering with a lot of different people. Okay, that's that question. Okay, uh, can cisgendered people experience anxiety surrounding their gender identity without necessarily wanting to change their gender insecurities, fears? Yes, absolutely. What advice would you give to someone experiencing this, especially young adults? Of course, yes. So our understanding of ourselves and our genders and how we're presenting ourselves to the world, what we wear, um, who we interact with, even you know what name or nickname we use, what pronouns we use, having um, uncertainties around that is really, really normal especially um, as young adults who are still understanding their, their uh, sense of self. So absolutely, um, yeah, as people go through puberty, yes, definitely. So yeah, I think it's really normal to have anxieties or fears around um, going through puberty and just changes that occur with our bodies that maybe we didn't really know much about what to expect Maybe as things are going, it's feeling more scary. Um, but yes, basically my basically my answer is yes, definitely. And just like us understanding like who we are and what our gifts are and what our skill sets are and what we want to do with our lives and our careers and what we want to have for lunch tomorrow may change. Um, over time, our understanding of our gender identity is one of those things that goes right along with it. So whether you ultimately, you know, under, end up identifying as, you know, cisgendered or trans or non-binary or gender fluid, 
Um, I think all of us at some point in our lives have had, um, have had experiences that maybe sat well or sat or didn't sit quite well with us as, as time went on. So I would say yes, absolutely. Um, and I think that's really normal. Um, okay. Question. Abigail, how do you maintain work-life balance <laughs> as a physician in NYC? Um, <laughs> Uh, I laugh because um, I think work-life balance is something that as a physician that we're all constantly striving for, I think that's part of it. For me, um, I personally love my work. I love what I do. So I tend to throw myself into it because I really care and I love it. Um, I would not have picked this field um, if I didn't. <laughs> so I think that that's one aspect of it. Also, New York City, um, I love it. It's also crazy and super busy, and there's always 10 million things going on, and um, this, you know, subway is late and et cetera. Um, I, my first two years out of residency, I was so used to having my whole life be residency that I made my whole life work after residency. Um, I went through a job change two months ago now, and that was, it took me a long time to get to a place where I felt like I wasn't letting the entire world down by changing jobs. And my current job, I have a lot more time to myself and it's noticeable. Um, I used to commute like three hours a day to my job at Planned Parenthood. And I loved my job. I loved the scope. I love the work, but that was a lot. And now I'm essentially like working from home two days a week. My per diem job I, takes me away for like four hours at a time, but I'm doing admin work remote. And then I'm working in clinic Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I don't work nights and I don't work weekends. Um, and I have been able to kind of find a balance recently that works for me, but it's, hasn't always been that way. And yeah, it, it is tricky. Um, I think when you prioritize yourself and what you want to do, um, and go into, you know, a job knowing what your priorities are and, you know, asking the, the hard questions to make sure that whatever job you end up in, is able to work with how your life is and what you want out of life and what your schedule is going to be like. I think that it's doable. Um, it takes uh, it, it takes some asking the tough questions though when you're looking for jobs, but it's doable for sure. Okay. Did I miss any questions? I tried to get through all of them and I apologize if that was rushed, but I want to wanted to make sure I got to all of the questions. Oh, of course, my, it says, thank you so much for coming and answering all our questions. My pleasure. That's why I'm here. I, I love working with students. Um, I love teaching. Um, I love sharing what I know with other people. I think that's so important. And I've always been very grateful for the people that listened to my questions and taught me. And so, you know, part of this is for me is giving, giving back what I can. So I hope that this was helpful and um, yeah, thank you for having me. Are there any other questions this evening? Yeah, so just like on a like a more general note, um, I like to ask this for like a lot of the people that I meet, um, who have experience in like their careers and like fields. And so what is just one thing that you would tell your younger self? Um I would tell my younger self that so I I was very anxious in medical school. 
my experience of medical school was incredibly like anxiety inducing because there's like all of these really smart people and it feels like it's supposed to be this really competitive environment. And for me, I'm not really a competitive person. I'm most motivated by me, not by other people. And so I felt like those years were really challenging. Um, and I felt a lot of anxiety during medical school um, just because I didn't feel good enough. And I would tell my younger self, like, nah, girl, like, you're going to be okay. Like, look where we are. Like, we've, you know, I've, I've had, um, you know, so many opportunities in my life so far after medical school that have allowed me to acknowledge the areas in which I excel. And it felt in medical school, like I was excelling in nothing. Like it just felt like everything was just so hard and scary. And it wasn't until after, like towards the end of medical school and residency, where I was able to really identify the parts of medicine that I'm really good at, like sitting down and studying for lectures and taking tests like all day, every day for years was just awful for me. But once I started to be able to see patients in person, then it was like, oh, wait, I do know this. Like I'm good at taking care of human beings. I'm good at talking to people. I'm good at helping people feel more calm and reassured when they're really scared about something. Um, I'm good at family medicine and using my skill set to loop in a lot of different people in a team and a family um, to help make sure someone gets the best care. Um, that I am great at procedures. I love procedures. I love talking about the things that I might feel uncomfortable to some people like gender and sex and birth control and STDs and abortions and all of those things that might be difficult for some people. It's like, oh no, I'm actually really good at those things. And so um, I think my message to my younger self would be, you know, just do the best that you can and let your best be okay. And know that just like our journey with understanding ourselves evolves over time, same thing in this career path, that the things that that you feel really good about yourself and the, um, and your gifts and your strengths, um, I think that those also come out with time too. So just keep going, you know, just make sure that um, that, you know, things will come out with time. And that your skills and the areas in which you shine will will continue to to become clear and visible as time goes on, and that's okay. Awesome. So, on that note, I think we're gonna close. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Brubaker, uh, for talking about your experiences in this field and all that you do. Um, for reference, for anybody that's has any other questions, feel free to email Dr. Brubaker. I put um, their email in the chat. Yep. Um, this is my personal email. So if you have additional questions, um, I feel free to email me. I will get back to you at some point, I promise. <laughs> um, and also for anybody else um, that's left, uh, here's the Eventbrite for our next um, event that's happening on December 12th, same time at 7 o'clock p.m. EST. Um, and yeah, so thank you so much, Dr. Brubaker, for being here and for joining us. Um, we appreciate it. And I hope everybody has a good rest of their day. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye, everybody.